Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, it is absolutely great uh, to see everybody here. Um, and uh, we just kind of referred to it yesterday, uh, the glorious 12th got a new meaning, I think. And so I hope uh, uh, a, a good number of you um, managed to, to make the most of that. Um, we have got a really interesting subject that I think is particularly welcome in uh, Wantage uh, tonight, being a hedgehog friendly place. Um, and absolutely tremendous speaker. Um, uh, and uh, I, ne I never thought I'd actually say this, um, that the, the man who literally wrote the book on the hedgehog. Um, Three books. Three books. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is fantastic. Um, uh, there, there's some pretty quirky names you've given the books, Q. I didn't give the titles to most of them. I mean, the, a prickly affair. Yeah. I mean, I didn't do the book's title is actually called The Hedgehog's Dilemma. I was referencing um, Schopenhauer's uh, critique of human interhuman relationships. And, um, and my publishers thought, now nah, we'll call it a prickly affair. The good thing is in America, they published it as The Hedgehog's Dilemma, uh, which is just one of those moments of, of, of delight and uh, Bloomsbury <laughs> getting one over on Penguin. Um, uh, great. Anyway, Here... I'll be advertising subtly throughout. So thank you for advertising at the beginning. Well, uh, I would commend everybody on the call to visit your website, um, uh, as well as the uh, uh, British Hedgehog Preservation Society website. Um, another little uh, promotion. Um, by the way, in um, just uh, going through some thank yous, uh, Faith, I think we do have Susie to thank uh, for making this come about. Whoops. <laughs> She's silent. She's silent. Uh, but I should say, yes, I'm very fortunate enough to know Susie's daughter, who is uh, uh, the, the greatest organist I've ever met. Um, I, I, I mean, she's good, but I've not met that many, so I don't quite know. And um, but she taught my son for um, two years at Magdalen as he was a chorister, and uh, and now, uh, um, uh, so therefore, I I am her greatest fan. So it is brilliant. Well, um, Hugh uh, is um, uh, listed uh, as an author, a ecologist, uh, spokesperson for the British Hedgehog Preservation Society. Um, uh, I think he's also very brave uh, with the um, phrase uh, he put in the uh, announcement introduction about physics, uh, which some of you um, may have uh, uh, had some concern about. And um, I always like to think of uh, the Wanted Café Scientifique uh, audiences respectful, but I hope they'll give you a good quizzing at the end of your talk uh, on that, Hugh. Um, uh, but uh, uh, really, really uh, looking forward to your talk and, and uh, uh, hedgehogs um, really are uh, well appreciated and regarded in Wantage, but uh, uh, we love to hear what you got to say. So I will get out of the way and the floor is yours. First bit of the talk, why did the hedgehog cross the road? It sounds like a bit of a joke, um, and, but actually it's a very useful title for a talk because uh, the entire talk is going to be based around the reasons why the hedgehog crossed the road. And the hedgehog crossed the road, uh, not to see its flat mate, not to show it had guts, not for any of the other appalling jokes which there are out there in various crackers, but the hedgehog crossed the road because we so designed our suburban landscape such that it didn't have a choice not to. Uh, so what I'm hoping for by the end of this is a real understanding uh, of the need for, for creating a hedgehog friendly landscape so the hedgehog does not have to cross the road. And, and I should apologise. Um, I'm not quite sure what got into me uh, a little bit of menace or devilment um but i was um i, I when when i was asked by uh, uh was it faith who wrote to me about this initially i um i, I did feel uh, i think oh another one of this lot and they're all bloody physicists um and i just been re i'd had this conversation recently with Robin Ince because I do some bits uh, with him he's got me on stage doing stand up comedy which actually is 
the scariest thing um, um, possible, really. It really is. But anyway, it was um, on one of his programs with, with Brian Cox that uh, uh, Brian Cox was referencing um, Ernest Rutherford, um, who had said, you know, that physics is the only real science and the rest is just cookery and stamp collecting. And, and I was just realizing at that moment um, how deeply unfair this is. And, um, and, and actually, I feel it's a sign of the deep insecurity, uh, especially on the part of physicists. Uh, and the first time I explored this line of thought was actually at a, um, a big event in London in a hall. And it turned out that most of the audience were um, physicists anyway. Uh, but it was, it's always nice to get a reaction, uh, whatever the reaction may be. And, and the point I make is really that on the whole, People like Brian Cox, um, um, you know, eternally young with lovely hair and all that sort of thing. Um, he spends his time, he'll sit behind a computer, which an engineer built, and he'll press a button and, and, and a big sort of collider will go whoosh and bing, and then loads of data will spew out. And he'll go, ooh, still don't know where 95% of the universe is. Can I have some more money, please? And um, whereas I'm out there in all weathers, studying hedgehogs with minimal budget um, and, and, um, and, and really not that much data because hedgehogs are quite slow to collect data from. And I think it's really the recognition on the part of the physicists that they have this, oh, they are the, the lightweights of the scientific community, that, that, that they demean the rest of us who, who do the real hard work. Um, I have since been asked by Robin Ince to clarify that that's not really what Brian Cox thinks. Uh, he only said it uh, because he was trying to be a comedian too. Anyway, um, so what I have done over the years, I have done a lot of this, but not of late. Um, I've, I'm very happy that younger people are doing the field work. It is quite strenuous. I started studying hedgehogs uh, in the mid 1980s, um, which has been alarming because I've been interviewed by people who weren't born then. Uh, and that's when I'm starting to realize quite how, how old I am uh, getting. But also how little my life has changed. Uh, I started studying hedgehogs up on Orkney, up on North Ronaldsey, the most northerly of those islands. And it was a, a proper project to look at whether the hedgehogs were impacting on the breeding success of ground nesting birds. Um, and from then on, I ended up radio tracking hedgehogs in, in Devon, in Scotland and other places. And um, I, I was sent this photograph recently by my mentor from that time, uh, Dr. Pat Morris. Uh, it was a photograph he took of me. And, uh, and the thing that amused me was just a couple of years ago, my wife took this photograph of me. And, and it's the lack of things that have changed in my life. My beard has got gray. Um, I'm still wearing the same colored top. And um, I, I am wearing gloves uh, because of the increased amount of knowledge at the potential transmission of zoo noses from our lovely little hedgehogs uh, uh, to uh, us humans. Um, I, met a, um, I met a woman uh, who ran, in my first book, I went and met a lot of the hedgehog rescues. And, well, quite, quite a few, some of the more eccentric ones. And I met one from Lincolnshire. And uh, we were talking uh, um, at, at length about her, her life. Um, she'd originally offered me uh, um, some food when I popped round, and, and, but her kitchen was also where she dealt with a lot of the hedgehogs. And there were empty food dishes, well, part consumed food dishes from the hedgehog cages uh, on, on the draining board next to the sink. And I, I have seen enough hedgehog feeding bowls to know that they do not have table manners and they often just poop in their food. And I was just saying, she was an eccentric woman. But at some point she'd gone to the doctors because she got a strange growth on her nose. And, um, and she was getting concerned about it, worrying about skin cancer. And the, the doctor reassured her that it wasn't skin cancer, but was perplexed as to how she'd managed to get ringworm on her nose, as it's not a normal position for uh, acquiring this, uh, this fungal infection. And so he said, do you do anything which might bring your nose into contact with you know, wild animals, for example? And she had to admit that she used to kiss every one of her hedgehogs goodnight. Anyway, so, so don't kiss hedgehogs and, and do wear gloves. And sorry, I'm already tan gently. Okay, other things I've done. Um, this is, uh, what I'm pointing out is that Brian Cox doesn't have to do this. You know, those physicists, they don't have to dress up and pretend to be Mrs. Tiggy Winkle in a pantomime with no rehearsals, with Bill Oddie, who didn't actually say a coherent word the entire time because he hadn't read the script either. And anyway, the balloons were too big for the dress. My wife went dress shopping with me, which was one first. Um, and this is Nick Baker, who used to be a presenter on The Really Wild Show before my Me Too moment. Um, this was, I, I tried very hard. I actually went and met a, a proper pantomime dame because my role was the pantomime dame of the, um, of the, 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 the uh, oh, what's the thing called up in Rutland Water, uh, the big bird festival. And um, I was, um, so I was basically holding the whole thing together. I thought, well, I've got to embody damehood. And so, I was told the things to, to work on um, uh, where you hold your hands and your voice. You've got to get the voice right. 
And so I thought I'd done quite well. My daughter was in the audience and managed to record about 20 seconds of me speaking before she had to leave due to the embarrassment of it all. Uh, and I ended up sounding not like a pantomime dame, but more like an extremely camp serial killer. Um, there are children still in therapy, I understand. But um, it, was, it was an experience, which I say, some people, physicists, they don't have to get dressed up as Mrs. Diggy Winkle. Anyway, so um, thank you already, uh, John, for, for the um, promotion, because, um, as you can imagine, a freelance uh, writer who actually earns a big chunk of their work uh, doing public speaking, uh, another chunk of their work photographing choirs performing. Um, um, my diaries have, have sort of rather, rather, rather emptied. Uh, so this is a really unsubtle advert. If I was doing this in person, what I would be doing is talking to you now um, uh, with a stack of books in front of me. So you've got a perpetual subliminal thing going. The great thing is, you can actually buy books whilst I'm speaking to you because you're on your computers, you've got no excuse. Um, anyway, so there we go, Subtle uh, is not my middle name. So I've written three books about hedgehogs so far. I'm write, I write about other things too. I'm just finishing a book on beavers at the moment, which is going to, um, well, I just don't know what the editor's going to do with some of those pages anyway. Uh, but the hedgehog stuff, um, I, my first book was actually an accident, uh, a prickly affair. I wasn't really planning on becoming an author, but um, living in, in East Oxford, uh, you're, one is surrounded by authors. Um, so I was just, it suddenly became a thing I should try and, and suddenly it happened. Um, and it's the reason, I mean, I love it because it was my sort of first, my first one, um, but also because it remains the only book in print to ever have had endorsements on the cover from both uh, um, Jonette Winterson, um, one of my, well, one of my favourite writers by, by quite a long uh, stretch, uh, and on the rear endorsements from Anne Widdicombe, um, which is the only time these two have ever agreed on anything, I think it's fair to say. Uh, and it's also quite fortunate that Anne Widdicombe clearly never read the book. Um, because uh, uh, while she did endorse it quite quite fondly, I think in the Mail on Sunday, um, I gave her a copy when I saw her turn up at Magdalen College. In fact, uh, and um, so I gave her a copy and, and just to get a photograph of her reading it, slightly terrified that she would um, um, actually have read it because uh, the, her reference in there uh, includes the first time I ever um, had anything to do with her was when she walked into a bookshop in Oxford um, recently after she had been particularly homophobic and racist and, um, and uh, somebody stuck a custard pie in her face whilst I was sitting there with a camera and got all the photographs. Anyway, um, so luckily she hadn't read that bit. Uh, my second book was, was endorsed by a, a very fine Robin and the Hedgehog book, the most recent of these came out at the end of last year. Um, had the great fortune to be out of print before it was published. Uh, um, that was that was the the I put the full hedgehog machine into to PR overdrive, and that worked quite well. Uh, they're all still available. Please do buy them. Um, as uh, John also said, I'm a spokesperson for the British Hedgehog Preservation Society, an organisation um, um, I, I love dearly, but I wish they would change their name because A, it sounds a bit like jam, and uh, um, B, when you've only got a short amount of time on the media, um, you're using up most of it announcing who you represent. <coughs> so, um, hedgehogs. I'm often asked, why, why the continual work with hedgehogs? Because uh, actually, if you think about what most people do when they start studying ecology, they, they get bitten, as it were, by the concepts of, within ecology, and they want to start studying the ideas and take those on further. Um, and I found that I started studying the hedgehog, and actually a lot, most people hadn't really done much work on the actual day-to-day -day life of the hedgehog. It's lots done on the hormonal fluctuations of hibernating hedgehogs, but very little basic ecology. And that's because they'd never really been considered a problem. And in fact, they are the nation's nature icon. Every time there's a vote or a poll about favorite mammal, favorite bit of wildlife, nature icon, the hedgehog always wins. And this is particularly important because people really love hedgehogs. And it means I can then have a conversation with people about hedgehogs, which can then move on to talk about issues which they may not be quite so excited about, whether it is habitat fragmentation, the, the, the food production system, our infrastructure network, all of these things um, uh, can be talked about using the springboard of the hedgehog. So I keep going on with the hedgehog because they allow me to talk about the full sort of range of, of ecological issues, which we really do need to address. And digging into the philosophy behind the hedgehog, my second book on the iconography of hedgehogs allowed me to do this a bit. Um, I found that I have become uh, a hedgehog uh, about hedgehogs, which is an unusual position to be in. Uh, if you're familiar with um, the Archilochus, the ancient Greek um, poet and uh, 
playwright, he coined the aphorism, uh, Lily Fox knows many things, the hedgehog knows just one good thing. And so this idea has been, been spun for, for yeah, millennia. Uh, um, in, in Persia, it was known as the, the clever fox's wise hedgehogs. So this relationship has always been there. And then in the 1950s, Isaiah Berlin wrote a very learned, uh, um, long essay uh, um, called The Fox and the Hedgehog, looking at the way people uh, view history mainly, but also uh, essentially uh, how they think about things, about the, the way they uh, um, cope with ideas. And in it, the, it the, the, the simplest way of looking at it was um, if you were to imagine ideas on a football pitch and it was the fox will have the entire football pitch covered with like an inch of water. It's like loads and loads and loads and loads of ideas covered with the, the, the mind of the fox. But the hedgehog will have the same amount of water, but it'll be in a well going straight down. Um, the, the hedgehog's ideas are based around one particular vision of the world. And so, yes, I have basically become a hedgehog. Uh, about hedgehogs, which is, is it's nice to have a, a speciality. Um, people love the hedgehog, but you've got to consider the way they have been referred to uh, throughout history. I'll let you read this one closely. And then I want you to think about the improbability of this. And then I want you to recognize that this is obviously written in archaic font. You can only begin to imagine um, um, the, 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 the guffaws uh, that happened when I found uh, this particular cutting from a 1763 book by Peter Fovagu, I think it is. And it's about the various myths about people, uh, people, about, about creatures. And, um, and it's one of the ones is that, they, they, that the hedgehogs would actually steal milk from recumbent cows. And in fact, um, in the 16th century, hedgehogs became part of the uh, unfortunate catalogue of creatures that were to be exterminated in preservation of the nation's grain. And a bounty was paid on, on the head of hedgehogs. Um, so people did kill them, partly because they thought they were stealing milk. Um, it, it, they are lactose intolerant. Uh, they don't know that. Um, and uh, they, that means that they are, un and also if you think about it, you know, the hedgehog is designed um, through the wonders of evolution to eat a diet rich in worms, um, small slugs, and other um, invertebrates. They have sharp pointy teeth and a relatively small mouth. And you think about the teeth, you, you don't really need to think about this. It's obviously nonsense. Um, so uh, to think about um, hedgehogs from the more practical um, side of things, each, every three years, uh, uh, we work with the People's Trust for Endangered Species and we produce the State of Britain's Hedgehogs uh, report and we are due another one out in September. And so it's a very frustrating time because the numbers are being crunched and I'm going to give you old data. I don't know the new answers yet. Uh, so what we knew when this report came out in 2018 was that since the year 2000, the population of hedgehogs in the UK had declined by 30% in urban areas and by 50% in rural areas. Now, there is some good news in that, in that the population decline in urban areas had leveled off. It was the same level as it was in 2015. Um, now, we don't know how many hedgehogs there are in the country. There are various estimates that appear in the press. They are um, wildly different. I mean, there are some people will regularly quote there being over 30, I think it's 32 million hedgehogs in the 1950s. That was an extrapolation from a summer's evening walk around Kew Gardens that somebody did. Uh, not necessarily the most robust, critical and a statistical analysis. Um, so we don't actually have a number, but what we do have is a series of citizen science uh, um, projects which have been running year in, year out. And what they represent is, uh, give us an indication of the change, the index changing over time. The Mammal Society estimated population decline um, of 66% since the mid 1990s, and that was in 2020, I think it was. Um, in 2020, the hedgehogs uh, got the rather uh, dubious accolade of being added to the red list as an endangered species threatened with extinction. Um, this is, yeah, this is obviously deeply disturbing. But um, I, I do an awful lot of talks with, with women's institute groups, University of the Third Age groups, uh, Probus groups, uh, Towns Women's Guild. I'm basically advertising here, just in case you have other groups that you're involved with. Um, and, uh, but they tend to be of an audience of, of a slightly more mature disposition. And it gives me an opportunity to speak to people who maybe have 20 or 30 years on me. And getting their view of what they remember in their childhood of the number of hedgehogs they would see compared to what they see now. Um, and I think it is not unreasonable to estimate very crudely that 
the population decline of hedgehogs in the United Kingdom is between 90 and 95 percent since the end of the Second World War. And that, so go back a slide, the nation's favorite animal, the nation's nature icon. This is the animal we love the most, yet we have got a population decline of such absolutely catastrophic, staggering levels. And that should really call us up a little bit and make us worried because if we can't save hedgehogs, and the reason we fuss about hedgehogs is because people don't care so much about uh, the macroinvertebrates that the hedgehogs eat, but the demise in hedgehogs is telling you an awful lot about the other stuff we don't care about so much. So there is something really worrying at risk there. And um, something which, which I really encourage people to take on board, but not to slip into hyperbole, dear Michaela. Uh, Michaela Strachan, uh, this is after the 2015 report came out. And um, she announced in a piece in the Radio Times that uh, uh, hedgehogs would be extinct in 10 years time. She drew a straight line on our graph um, of population decline and, and it hit zero in 10 years. So now gosh, four years time. Um, hedgehogs will not be extinct in four years. They would not be extinct in 10 years back then. But when this sort of thing happens, my phone um, starts ringing quite a lot. And uh, I was pretty sure that she was simply being misquoted um, because uh, she probably is referring to, to localized extinctions or you know, that sort of thing. And actually, if you're a journalist, you're not going to hear uh, um, that, that little bit of nuance because you're tra one of the key parts of journalism, I think, is to train you to, to miss uh, uh, the nuance of science. Anyway, a full day of me criticizing scientists and asking them to possibly reconsider uh, the, the way they work and listen really closely to what's said um, so that they didn't make this mistake again because clearly they won't be extinct in 10 years. And by the beginning of day two, I was getting a little maybe bored of this. Uh, but the independent phoned me and bless them, uh, they had a journalist who who quoted me precisely. Um, and obviously, this has left me no longer getting Christmas cards from Michaela. Um, also, the thing is, rather embarrassingly, I do offer media training for people who want to help you know, learn how to communicate their scientific ideas or their campaigning ideas. And, and one of the th key things you say is, think before you speak, please. Anyway, um, the Independent used this picture of a hedgehog for nearly all their hedgehog stories for quite a long time. And, um, and it's quite revealing, actually, because this is a hedgehog with three key uh, uh, warning signals on it. The most obvious is it's out in daytime. Um, it, it's got ticks all over its face and it just looks as anybody's got, you've had a, a kid, you've had any pets, it just looks peaky. It's a peaky hedgehog. This is the hedgehog now uh, that I would recommend you scoop up using your gardening gloves because you don't want to go catching any of those nasty zoonoses on your noses um, and scoop up, put them in a box and get in touch with the British Hedgehog Preservation Society. The uh, very easy to find on the internet. Um, uh, though I was doing a talk in Brighton um, last week, and uh, BHPS actually stands for the Brighton and Hove Philharmonic Society. Um, so BHPS, uh, British Hedgehog Preservation Society, um, and phone them any time of day or night. There is an answer phone which will lead you to a phone tree which will get you the nearest hedgehog rescue. Actually, where you are wanted, you've got, well, Digcot, where you've got little foxes, and, and to the east you've got um, Mrs. Tiggywin, because I'm not sure if you've actually got a rescue your way. But stick a hedgehog in a box, keep it calm, keep it quiet, get in touch, find your local rescue, then keep the hedgehog warm. Uh, you can create a hot water bottle with a sort of two litre drinks bottle of warm water, uh, wrap it, give it a towel to roll up in, um, and, and uh, jam jar lids of, of, of dried kitten kibble or meaty pet food, and jam jar lid of water. Um, and but put a lid on it because even if it looks like this, it might suddenly decide to escape. And if it does escape and climb out of the box, it will find the one thing in your kitchen or wherever you've put it, which is hardest to move. And then it will squeeze behind there and it won't come out. Um, and this is a, it's a known fact. It's always one of those laws of, of ecology, really. Uh, my, my mentor, Pat Morris, took a hedgehog into a Radio 4 studio uh, many years ago when they used the big tape decks and it was all uh, large equipment. And the presenter wanted to hold the hedgehog and the presenter dropped the hedgehog because it was prickly, because sometimes humanities graduates get jobs that they shouldn't have. And um, this was a dropped hedgehog on the floor, scuttled behind the mixing desk, which had to be dismantled 
because once the hedgehog has gone into a tight space, you can't pull it back out because it prickles catching on. Anyway, anyway, this is a real tangent to what I'm supposed to be talking about. I should focus. Anyway, why are hedgehog numbers dr dr declining so dramatically? Um, if you look at uh, our rural landscape, um, the picture is pretty grim there. Uh, this is a field of oilseed red grain in Cambridgeshire. Um, and uh, it was the photograph was taken by me in an attempt to, to stop crying, really, because my father-in-law has a, got a pilot's license and decided that our then five-year-old son uh, should be put into a, a car seat into the front seat of a small aeroplane and be taken for a ride and then at a thousand feet be given the controls. Um, it's one of, I mean, this is as scary as, as going on stage at uh, the Bloomsbury Theatre, really. Anyway, um, a field of all seed rape like this is for it to be grown economically. Um, uh, Professor David Goulson uh, um, did an analysis of, of DEFRA's uh, data, 17 applications of biocide per crop. That's not 17 different outings, obviously, but tank mixes are used. On average, 17 different biocides are applied to these crops, or 17 doses. Uh, so this will include uh, insecticides and fungicides and, uh, and herbicides, all of these things, to these fields. For a farmer to turn a profit like this, they need to remove competition. And unfortunately, competition is also hedgehog food. It, it's bird food, it's bat food, it's toad food, it's slow worm food, it's all of this wildlife, which could live out their food. And uh, the, the job of the farmer is to, to sort of make sure that the playing field is leveled entirely in their direction. And that results in an ecological desert. Um, if you look at the decline in, in farmland birds, there are a few generalist species which are doing okay because they make the most of these things. But the vast majority of farmland birds, uh, the population index is down by over 60% in the last 40 years. Was it 50 years now? I can't remember. I think it's maybe it's the 50 years now. That's the BTO's data. It's really serious declines are happening there. The hedgehog population, 50% decline um, since the turn of the century. So... In addition to that, you need to maximize the size of your fields because you know, this was obviously being done for, for uh, decades, uh, taking up hedges, but also then neglecting the hedges that are there. Um, bigger fields, more chance of making a profit. Hedgehogs are not um, named on, on a complete whim. I mean, they, they are named because they hog the hedges. They're an edge specialist, a woodland edge specialist. Before we turned up and made hedge rows, they were edge hogs. They lived around the edges of woodland. They lived, they, they flourished by the glades uh, within woodland. Um, we created a landscape of absolute delight for hedgehogs by, by networking it with these hedgerows. And um, whilst John Clare was being driven mad during the, the enclosures, uh, um, you know, the hedgehogs were probably very happy. Uh, so we have done good things, but the population is now suffering from this. Um, the, it's impossible to have the conversation about farmland hedgehogs without discussing badgers. Now, this does upset some people. Um, I was, I was got, I got to be one of the, the speakers at a uh, the Badger Trust conference a few years ago, and as the chairman of the Badger Trust uh, was walking me up onto stage uh, to introduce me, he in a stage whisper pointed out that he'd left the uh, um, uh, fire exit ajar so it was easier for me to get out, um, because I was about to upset badger lovers. You see, there are two sorts of people when it comes to badgers, on the whole. I mean, I. I exaggerating slightly. Um, there are those who see the badger as in the pantheon of all that's good, uh, um, somewhere uh, between Mother Teresa and Lady Di. You know, there is absolutely nothing that the badger can do wrong. And then there's the other sort of person who understands uh, that the four horsemen of the apocalypse had a pet badger and that badgers are responsible for uh, um, COVID, uh, Donald Trump, uh, Brexit and climate change, amongst other things. Um, and um, and the, the where I always fall foul is with the really bad joke, which I have to say now, and I apologize in advance. It's not a black and white issue, okay? Um, it's ecology. This is the point. You want simplicity, become a physicist. Uh, well, unless you're doing the magic stuff. Uh, but ecology is complicated. Do badgers eat hedgehogs? Yes, they do. I know they eat hedgehogs because I am unfortunately possibly the only person who can say that they have been uh, um, at radio tracking hedgehogs and then stumbled into, uh, into a bramble bush only to find my little willy being eaten by a badger. Uh, that was also a lesson in learning how to name your hedgehogs maybe slightly more sensibly. Um, so I, I have seen this happen. It really does happen. We have uh, funded um, 
uh, proper peer-reviewed science in nature, uh, showing how you have increased populations of badgers, you have decreased numbers of hedgehogs in those areas. It's very easy then to leap to the conclusion that the decline in rural hedgehogs is down to the increased numbers of badgers. And there are those with slightly less uh, ecological literacy. Um, let's think of most of the contributors to the Sunday Telegraph. Robin Page, who was actually sacked from the Telegraph for being too much of a racist bigot, uh, and others who leap at this opportunity to say, well, we must kill badgers to save hedgehogs. It's such a shame. It's such a shame we've got to kill badgers. Um, and no, this is not the way it works, because these animals have coexisted uh, since the last uh, um, ice, the ice sheets over 10,000 years ago. And in the previous interglacials, hedgehogs and badgers were both here as well. Um, they can and do live together. They've lived together very fine. Thank you very much. In terms of the numbers of badgers uh, that have been killed um, um, by, uh, by farmers trying to manage this pest compared to the numbers of badgers killed on the roads, you know, the, the roads are a far more effective uh, tool here. The issue is actually down to this, it's the asymmetric intraguild predatory relationship. Um, these two species um, operate within the same ecological guild. Uh, they both eat the same thing most of the time. They eat worms. Um, they eat worms and other macroinvertebrates. And our best understanding of it is that when the wider ecosystem is degraded, the relationship shifts from being one of competition to being one of predation. The badgers have other advantages. They are a more effective predator than hedgehogs when it comes to the macroinvertebrates. Badgers can dig, hedgehogs can just scratch the surface. Badgers are also far more omnivorous. Um, um, this scattering of peanuts around these badgers here you know, is a delight to the badgers, but the hedgehogs may eat a peanut too. It's not very good for them. They get stuck in the roof of their mouth, etc. They're not really designed to eat peanuts. Then again, uh, neither are badgers really, but they can and do eat them. Badgers have many advantages. Also, badgers don't um, suffer in the same way that hedgehogs do from longer, extended, warmer, wetter winters. Um, hedgehogs are going into hibernation and having their hibernation disturbed throughout the winter. Badgers don't hibernate and can come out and when it is able, they can find food and they will be able to feed. So we add to this the fact that badgers fragment the landscape. They create a landscape of fear. Um, if you radio track hedgehogs uh, uh, in the countryside, um, they will try and radially disperse from a village and they will uh, um, go down the edges, the hedgerows, the fence rows. And if they come across a badger latrine or active badger set, they will stop, turn around and come back again. So badgers restrict the ability of hedgehogs to move through the landscape. It's quite difficult being a hedgehog. Especially also when we add in um, this, um, it's probably 100,000 hedgehogs a year are killed on the roads. Um, and our sort of guesstimate population for hedgehogs, spring population of hedgehogs is around half a million. It's a bit rough. So it's a 20% yeah, take of the year. Um, obviously, there are young which are then uh, um, um, replenishing those numbers. It's, it's a serious conservation level concern. But in the same way that badgers kill hedgehogs, they also fragment the landscape. Roads kill, well, the traffic kills hedgehogs. And this is the ring road around Oxford. There was a horrible car crash there um, 10 or 15 years ago, uh, and they put in concrete barriers. That turned this road, um, which splits shot over from East Oxford, uh, from being difficult to cross to being impossible to cross. And all over the country, um, these, road, the, these concrete barriers have been put in place. And um, there is no need for there to be any extra environmental um, impact assessment uh, on, on, on this thing. They all fit comes in permitted development. I've checked that with the highways agent, well, Highways England. Um, this means that we're creating barriers to the ability of hedgehogs to move through the landscape. And we're beginning to here get to the heart of what's really the problem. Um, the barriers can come in all sorts of forms. Uh, this is a canalized ditch about 50 meters behind me. Boundary Brook used to be a brook. And uh, then in the 1980s, um, to stop it flooding, uh, uh, they, they made it into a, a deep canalized uh, thing here. And um, that probably would have worked if Thames Water hadn't become a money grabbing, uh, corner cutting bunch of tow rags who then don't clean the drains and let them flood sewage into my neighbor's gardens. Hey, that's issues. Uh, but they've also created a fantastic pitfall trap. Um, another very useful ecological tool. Unfortunately, this is a pitfall trap which 
um, hedgehogs cannot escape from. Once they're in it, they're stuck. So I've rescued four in the last 20 years and don't often walk down here during daytime. So it is, you know, the, the way that the landscape is fragmented happens on the macro scale and the micro scale too. We chop the landscape up and this is important because little hedgehogs, they may be little hedgehogs, but they can walk a very long way. Um, this is work from my uh, uh, friend, Nigel Reeve, uh, Surrey Golf Course, one male hedgehog, 12 nights, uh, I've played an entire round, but that's a 30 hectare golf course. And um, what he found was that the home range of male hedgehogs was about 30 hectares, female hedgehogs about 10 hectares. They don't have territories that they defend. They have home ranges which they share somewhat grumpily. A male hedgehog will easily walk two kilometres a night if it wants to. So then you start to think, what does this mean for a minimum viable population? This is the um, sort of analytical tool we can use to try and work out um, if you've got an island in the middle of the ocean and it's the most amazing, beautiful, hedgehog friendly island, you've got one male hedgehog in the middle of the island, that's obviously not a viable population. If the same island is there, but it's a desert island with no trees and no worms and you've got a million hedgehogs, that is obviously not a viable population. You can work with computer modeling, all of the variables, and you begin to work out what are the minimum requirements for a population of hedgehogs to be able to thrive. And um, uh, Tom Morehouse from the University of Oxford uh, stepped up to do this rather complicated maths for us and showed that in good habitat, which actually isn't that dissimilar to this uh, um, golf course um, and surrounds, you need a starting population of about 32 and you need 90 hectares of unfragmented landscape. That's nearly a square kilometer of unfragmented land. So that is in the best possible habitat. You move to our farmed landscape and you need a much bigger starting population and four or five square kilometers. Um, in suburbia, where are we going to find a square kilometer of unfragmented habitat, which hasn't got a canal running through it or uh, a busy road running through it or new fences put up from a housing development? Where are we going to find those islands? Now, obviously the islands we create in suburbia are not as impermeable as our ocean going island, but they are still islands which restrict the ability of hedgehogs to come in and out of areas. To give you an example, this is absolutely delightful and I love technology. Um, uh, this is work that, that the youngsters are now doing. Uh, they're not out all night long radio tracking hedgehogs because they know that's just stupid and exhausting. Uh, so they attach GPS tags to the hedgehogs. Um, um, have a look here, you'll see the clock at the top, eight, PM, the hedgehogs start moving. We were having this conversation earlier. Uh, the male hedgehogs, the red one is a good one to pay attention to. The male hedgehogs move uh, um, considerably further. Um, six, seven, eight, here we go. There we go, eight o'clock, off they go. And um, you begin to see the sorts of distances they will travel. This is not um, an unusual population of hedgehogs. This is very normal hedgehog behavior. And it really drives home the need to have a porous landscape to allow the hedgehogs to be able to move between the gardens. Um, you can see at the top of this picture there is a, a dual carriageway or a motorway um, and you know, that is providing a border up there preventing the hedgehogs leaving this particular estate. I think this really drives home uh, uh, the need for well, the campaign we launched which is Hedgehog Street. You see we have um, uh, um, we can make our gardens perfectly hedgehog friendly, we can make the most amazing wildlife friendly gardens Sorry, wildlife friendly gardens. And you can be, I mean, like now it's dusk, uh, the blackbirds I can hear outside are going bonkers. Um, uh, yeah, it, soon we're gonna be having bats and, and moths flitting around the place uh, as, as things warm up. And, and during the day, we can sit out there with a nice cup of coffee and there are all sorts of birds and butterflies and bees and things flying around the place. But all of these uh, creatures have the slight advantage uh, of flight. The hedgehogs don't have that. So the simple idea of Hedgehog Street is you make your garden hedgehog friendly um, and that means you, you, you abandon the cult of tidiness, the cult of tidiness, which has warped your brain into some weird thing of thinking you need a lawn with nothing else and maybe a few manicured borders. You don't need these things. These, this is like uh, sort of some Stepford wife thing. You don't need to do that. You're being overtaken uh, by the industrial capitalist complex attempting to, to further remove you from contact with nature. You need to have wildness. You need to have untidiness. Um, so we really recommend you know, a bramble patch, a log pile, a compost heap. Uh, all of these things will really help. But the most important bit is to let the hedgehogs in. Make the hole um, 13 centimetres across the size of a CD case, but apparently people don't really know what they are anymore. Um, that's the size of the hole, uh, just at the bottom of your fence, obviously not at the top of your fence. 
Um, if you want to become elaborate, you can, oh, sorry, and forgot this because it's our 10th birthday. Um, Hedgehog Street, we've been doing this for 10 years. Uh, if you go to our website, hedgehogstreet.org, happy birthday to us. I did not choose that URL. Um, you can then use that to take the garden challenge and you will get some top tips uh, from there. You, just a few ideas about what your garden is like. Join up as become a hedgehog champion. Um, painless and free and um, you get access to a whole bunch of amazing uh, uh, resources on the Hedgehog Street website. Um, but, so, oh, can I put this in too? Yes, so what, I was interested about this because I did a talk to the Hendreds recently well, maybe it's last year. And I can't remember, it was a gardening club or a something club in uh, one of the hundreds. And I remember looking across and on the map and being rather impressed by the fact that Grove and Wantage seemed to be in the middle of a fantastic battle of who was the cutest place. I don't know whether there's any strife between Wantage and Grove, um, but I, I measure the quality of a, uh, of a town or a village um, and by the number of sightings of hedgehogs recorded on the big hedgehog map. It's part of the Hedgehog Street campaign. And uh, as you can see here, absolutely fantastic. Um, disturbingly, rather a lot of dead hedgehogs. Um, where's that place? C, is it Chalton or Carlton or something like that? Anyway, uh, there seems to be a lot of dead hedgehogs there. Um, this is great because it means there are people here in this part of the country who are really keen to do things about hedgehogs, that they're already part of the Hedgehog Street campaign. And maybe, um, maybe indicate in the chat if you're actually part of the people who've been putting these, these data out on the site. Anyway, it's a really useful tool for us because it gives us an indication of what's going on. So making the holes can be hard work. Um, I am, I'm really bad with power tools. Uh, my wife buys power tools. I, I tend to do the work, but she's sort of interested in them. I find, maybe this is my anti-physicist thing coming through. I even find electricity quite terrifying. Um, so, so when you've got an enormous power tool like that, drilling through a wall, it's just, just really scary. Luckily, I had a, a, a builder friend of mine uh, oversaw me doing this particular job because um, I, I was not confident. Anyway, um, make the hole and let the hedgehogs come. Uh, it does work. I even have a stunt hedgehog with me to show that it does. You can use an angry hedgehog and a catapult. Uh, this is the, the Cherwell Boathouse in, in North Oxford. Um, and actually, people have done the most innovative ways of making the holes. I mean, we, you, you can get yourself your hedgehog highway signed from the Hedgehog Street campaign, um, put it proudly above the hole you've made, but obviously talk to your neighbor first. Uh, and then the idea is because it's a hedgehog street, you get your neighbor to talk to their neighbor and on and on and on. And then soon, very soon, we are going to have the most rambunctious hedgehog street parties as people will deck the road with hedgehog bunting and have hedgehog shaped cakes. These are all real things. And I'm a big fan of WI Talks because I get cake, I like cake. Um, but I, I organized a great hedgehog bake off in fact in Whitney back in 2019, that was fun. Um, because then we had loads of cakes in the shape of hedgehogs. And uh, unfortunately the mayor of Whitney in his wisdom decided that they should then be auctioned off so I couldn't try them all. Bastard. Anyway, um, so we can make the holes in many different ways. And my favorite village, um, I'm afraid, uh, is Kirtlington, north of Oxford. And Chris Powell's um, a friend of mine who lives there. I've been and talked to the Kirtlington and Wildlife Conservation Society on a few occasions, and they were well aware of the importance of connectivity. And in fact, what they did was they got a map of the village, a detailed map of the village, and worked out the minimum number of holes they needed to make in the walls. It's the foothills of the Cotswolds, so a lot of it's stone walls. The minimum number of holes to get the maximum amount of coverage. And they went to town on it. I mean, this full creation of these, these, these sort of Neolithic tomb style um, holes under, I think these actually technically up in Derbyshire, this is known as a smoot, um, a hole in a wall like that. But otherwise people were using drills, they were connecting up through the, into the churchyard, they were connecting gardens, it's wonderful. But my friend Chris's garden is two and a half feet lower than his neighbor's garden. And I asked him what he was going to do about that. And he said, um, he said, uh, without you know, breaking into a grin, that he's going to build a staircase, which I thought was quite funny. Um, so he built a staircase. And, um, and this, is, this is quite remarkable. Uh, very pretty, fits in the character of the whole thing. And on the very first night that the staircase was opened, a hedgehog was caught on camera coming through the hole at the top, pausing on the days. I like to think taking in the surroundings before sashaying down the stairs imagining big band music or some such thing. This 
works. These staircases actually work. We've got, um, he sent me a video from a couple of years after he opened this up. And this little short video will show you two things. One, it'll show you uh, that the hedgehogs can go up the staircase, both forwards and backwards. But also it'll introduce you, if you watch carefully, to a slight design flaw. So um, I have asked him to install a banister now at the top, just to avoid the sort of embarrassment of that. Um, the good thing is hedgehog spines, uh, they're modified hair, the same stuff as we've gone ahead. Um, they are fantastic shock absorbers. They are designed, uh, they, they enter the, where they enter the body, they are pinched um, and going into the bulb in the skin and uh, also slightly curved so that when the hedgehogs fall, the whole thing springs and they, they will climb quite scarily high. I, I've um, had stories from people who were disturbed uh, by a noise is in the Virginia creeper outside their first floor bedroom window, only to find a rat and a hedgehog having a fight. Um, so they will and do climb uh, reasonably effectively. Uh, but Chris went one better than this. I, I, a few weeks ago, I went to photograph him for an article I was writing, and he, um, he said one of his neighbours has got an even bigger difference in height between his garden and his neighbour's garden. And so he's built a ramp. And this is brilliant because it works. I mean, it's covered, I think it puts some sort of cement on it or something like that to make it slightly rough. Um, and this works. Build it and they will come. Make the holes, work out ways of connecting up your gardens and you will see what comes. Um, obviously, the easiest thing is if the fences come with holes in them in the first place and fencing uh, supplies are beginning to pick up on this um, because, because well, I've been, been getting uh, um, I'm grumpy and active about things. Uh, a couple of years ago now, change.org, the petition site got in touch with me and asked me to launch a petition um, to help get hedgehogs back to their former glory, they asked. They said, what would you ask for to get hedgehogs back to their former glory? I said, that's simple. Uh, we'll have a petition calling for the dismantling of industrial capitalism and the replacing of it with something nicer. Uh, and, and they said that was a bit too ambitious. So we ended up having a slight sort of discussion about things and we ended up with something which is almost embarrassingly small, that I was going to ask the Secretary of State for Housing um, to get planning law change such that all new housing developments come with hedgehog highways built in place. This is not a discussion about whether we need 300,000 new houses built per year and if particularly they need to be built in Oxfordshire, um, all in the same place, which is sometimes feels like it is going to be without any additional infrastructure, etc. But if the houses are going to be built, then let them be built with uh, um, um, the, these hedgehog holes. Um, this is again, it's the thing where if we were in person, I would be giving you Paddington stairs and encouraging you all uh, uh, to sign up to change.org slash save our hedgehogs. Um, it, it'd be great if you did. Um, I was encouraged to do this because um, every time I write an update, which has been nearly 100 times now, uh, uh, that goes to all the people who signed the petition. So when it got to 10,000, that's like exciting. When we got to half a million signatures, I ended up having a meeting with the then housing minister. Uh, which was rather impressive, and the boss of one of the largest developers in the country. Uh, that's where I found out it would cost maybe 50p more per house to have the hedgehog holes put in there. So there's really not much cost involved with this. Uh, then in July 2019, cast your mind back uh, to a time when you possibly thought things really couldn't get any worse, just as the priapic marshmallow moved into number 10. At that moment of transition, we had a a flurry of stuff being done by ministers who knew they were going to be moved on. And uh, James Brokenshire was the then uh, uh, minister. And he, on the la his last day in office, he um, uh, put out a, a change to the national planning policy framework, uh, which is the document that goes to all the local authorities, uh, planning departments, and it's the way that they decide what can and can't be built. And in it, there was the inclusion that guidance was that all new housing development should come with hedgehog highways. And in the same paragraph, that there should be swift bricks built into the houses too. Part of the delight I have with that is that the RSPB had spent at least a decade, the biggest conservation group in the country, I spent a decade campaigning on that one thing. I'd spent by that stage about a year in my shed. Um, and I so say we, we managed to get this, but it's only guidance. And I kept the petition open because I wanted to go back and chat to the minister. But as you'll remember, July 2019 was when everything stopped to do Brexit. 
that went well. And then obviously other stuff happened at the beginning of 2020, which whilst we cannot directly blame uh, um, our marshmallow in chief, um, stuff happened. And so basically I've kept the petition going because I really, really want to sit down with the minister and say, okay, can we have a chat now? But at the moment they really aren't answering my calls. But the exciting thing for me is that we are at nearly 975,000 signatures. Um, the, I, I'm hoping that we'll get to a million uh, by the time that uh, um, I eventually get to have a meeting with the ministers. I'm kind of guessing that the million thing will be the key. They will go, OK, you know what? You've made your point. Um, and um, also, if you are interested in hedgehogs, uh, which obviously you are, uh, the latest issue of the BBC Wildlife magazine, which is just out, um, uh, has uh, a 10 page feature by, by me all about hedgehogs, lots of lovely pictures. And I got the greatest accolade I have ever had, um, um, uh, being described as the Lorax of Hedgehogs by Tom Holland. My daughter was absolutely, absolutely astounded um, and then discovered this is Tom Holland, the author and Radio 4 presenter, then she became very disappointed. Um, I'm conscious of time and John sort of reappeared and I'm, I'm sort of nervous about this. Um, um, so I, I can, oh, I must tell you to sign up to the Hedgehog Highways Facebook group just because it's a, um, it's a, it's a wonderful way of sharing ideas about things because it's, um, oh, John's gone again, that, is, is he getting grumpy? Um, your garden, make it hedgehog friendly. If you've got an ornamental pond, uh, don't. Uh, but if you do have a ramp so the hedgehogs can get out, uh, don't drop litter because only idiots drop litter. Um, and don't stream hedgehogs because they really, really don't like it. Uh, there is a problem. The hedgehog has no fight or flight response. Um, the, the, when they're frightened, they simply frown uh, and then, then curl up into a ball if they're really frightened. This is a very effective defense strategy against many things, but not badgers, hedgehog, uh, strimmers and, and cars. And similarly, bonfires, the same thing. Um, if you must have a bonfire in your garden, build it on the day you are going to burn it. Um, and then if you're lucky, you'll get some of this. And then if you're really lucky, you'll get some of this, the hedgehog carousel. Um, here we have the female hedgehog in the middle. You can see she's frowning. Uh, the spine's brought forward over her forehead, covering her nose and her eyes, um, and the male is circling her. Uh, mating cannot take place while the female frowns. Uh, you can make of that as you will. And um, this can go on, this can go on for over an hour. Um, and uh, eventually, I mean, it takes the female to relax for mating to take place. But this leaves frequently a flattened arena of vegetation which is mysterious in origin when you stumble across them and has led to the greatest headline The Guardian has ever carried. Uh, back in 1991, hedgehogs cleared of corn circle dementia. <laughs> um, the seriologists uh, uh, were meeting uh, for their annual conference. Um, their, their keynote speaker was none other than the recently self-proclaimed son of God himself, David Icke. Um, and uh, somebody had suggested that some of the crop circles might have been caused by circling hedgehogs. And with the wonderful application of science, somebody else had calculated that it would have required around 40,000 hedgehogs working in synchrony to make even the more modest crop circles, which then meant it was back to the same argument about whether it was Earth energies rising or, or um, aliens landing, uh, uh, or, or those people in the pub with the planks of wood and the ropes and the pints of cider having a laugh. Who knows which it could have been. Anyway, um, so to, to wrap up, sorry, John, uh, what have hedgehogs ever done for us? Which is uh, uh, the question which sometimes comes up from um, oh, mainly physicists uh, you know, who want to see some anthropocentric vision of, of, uh, the, um, of the world. Um, you know, hedgehogs are not key to our pollinator efforts. You know, they're really not. When the hedgehogs disappear. You know, they're not going to stop pollinating our apple trees. And they're not ecosystem engineers like our wonderful beavers are, but but I made a claim in my first book that the hedgehog was the most important creature on the planet. I even abused a phrase from a, a, a TV series at the time and argued that save the hedgehog, save the world. Um, this is a slogan which, interestingly, I, I discovered was taken up by the Dutch Mammal Society, um, who invited me over in 2019. And uh, uh, they actually have it on their merchandise. They have in, in, in Dutch, um, save the hedgehog, save the world, uh, which I, I absolutely adore. But this cover, just have a look at it. Obama and me, Desmond Tutu speaks, okay, two of the most important people on the planet, marginalized by my claims about the hedgehog. I, I think that shows you that there is possibly hope. Um, so, and this was before Greta was even born, probably. Uh, so anyway, we've got my arguments about the qualities of the hedgehog, which, which are not hyperbole, actually. They are rooted in, I hope, reason. 
so there was an American writer, Stephen Jay Gould, and, and he coined a phrase, uh, he said, we, we, will, we will not fight to save what we do not love. Um, and he was talking about conservation. He was talking about the fact that people will only be encouraged to fight once they've gone beyond liking stuff. And social media, I think, is very, very um, insidious in the way it gets us to like things. Liking is half-hearted. We need to love stuff if we're going to really fight for it. So conservation and wildlife groups, how do we deal with this? How do we get people to fight for nature? Nature's big, nature's, ooh, how do we, we'll get them to fall in love with the easy stuff. We'll get the charismatic megafauna, the elephants and the tigers, the whales and the dolphins, and that will help. People will fall in love with nature that way. And let me take you back to me uh, as a teenager. Uh, this is a bit alarming. Um, I had three posters on my bedroom wall. Um, I had a, a humpback whale breaching, amazing picture. And I had a really powerful tiger above my bed. And I had a picture of a young woman who'd been playing tennis but forgotten her underwear. Um, and so obviously I shopped a lot at Athena. And this was also, thinking back to this, I'm as likely to get nose to nose with the tennis girl as I am with that humpback whale. You know, these things just aren't going to happen. Uh, in the end, if we're lucky, we'll fall in love with the girl or the boy next door. And the hedgehog is the animal equivalent. It's the one we actually have a chance of getting close to. And again, this is not magic. It's because the hedgehog doesn't have a fight or flight response. It means when you've rescued it from that canalized ditch, you can make it pose for photographs and it will run roll eventually. And if you're lucky, you will have a calm moment when it will look into your eyes and it will notice you. And then it will toddle off and do its own hedgehoggy things. And it's in a moment of connection like that that I found certainly the transition from liking stuff to loving it really happens. And that's why the hedgehog is so important because you can throw bread at ducks in the park or whatever it is you're supposed to do these days and, and have birds in your bird feeder and you know, the be beautiful moths and butterflies, but they don't really have much character. The hedgehog is full of character. It's an enormous, fantastically well-evolved predator. It's bigger than 99% of all animals that have ever lived on the planet. It's in the top 1% with the blue whale, Tyrannosaurus rex and us. It's most of the animals have been very small. Um, it's an amazing creature and we can get close to it. And if we're lucky enough, we get that moment of making a point of connection, which will change the way we look at the entire natural world. So thank you very much. I'm very sorry for overrunning. I got a bit carried away then. Um, I shall, there you go, stop sharing. And um, here we go. Th anyway, thank you very much. And um, I'll have a look at the chat and see if anybody has. You, that was just a treat, a prize. And I'm so <laughs> sorry if uh, my monkey and about on the screen, uh, uh, I, I'm, I hope I didn't um, rush you or speed, uh, whatever, but. Uh, I've, I've been you. for a long time, and, uh, and, and given that I charge by the, by the minute, you know, I didn't want to break <laughs> your bank. Um, so. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, it really, really was uh, special. Um, and at uh, times hilarious, um, uh, at times pretty hard hitting too, actually. So uh, very special, and, and thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, I want to make a prediction that the uh, Hedgehog Preservation Society uh, are never, ever going to let you go as a spokesman for them. Um, <laughs> it, it is a strange thing. Um, it is a strange thing. I mean, I, every now and then, I spent a year uh, uh, deeply involved with pangolins, but uh, yeah, never really. And then again, that's another animal that rolls up into a ball and is largely insectivorous. I think there's a common uh, um, theme running through here. Um, I was going to have a look at, we, we've got some questions coming in here. Uh, and if, if I run through the ones we've got, um, um, AH asks, ticks. Um, yeah, it's, I would, I would, uh, 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 rather than trying to remove ticks myself, I'd actually rather go to somebody who was experienced at doing it. Uh, especially if the hedgehog is anyway distressed, it's much better to get somebody who knows how to remove ticks. If you're very good at removing ticks and know you're not gonna squeeze the blood back into the hedgehog, leave mouth parts to get infected, etc., uh, uh, then that's it. But I, I would recommend going to a rescue. Um, and how big a step can a hedgehog climb? Uh, Faith, that, that's a very good point. Well, you saw obviously the video of, of what the hedgehog can do. I met a, um, met a gentleman at a, an event I was doing in Oxford uh, and he sort of strode up to me. He was one of those quite tall 
gentleman who wore red trousers at the weekend, you know, sort of character. And um, but he, he got his phone out and said, I, I've got something to show you. And you just get slightly nervous when people do that. Uh, and um, but he's got a photograph of a hedgehog standing uh, on some carpet by a door. And he said, that's my bedroom. Uh, and, and I was so anyway, th this man had been um, woken up one night uh, by a strange noise outside his bedroom door, opened the door and there was a hedgehog uh, on in the first floor. So he climbed up the staircase to the first floor. Uh, and uh, it was a very hot day, uh, it had been a very hot day, so he'd left his back door open. And um, so he took the hedgehog, put it outside, uh, and um, uh, the next morning when he went his, to, to his um, um, attic office, he found that the hedgehog had already been up there because it had dropped a little turd right beside his desk. Um, so the hedgehog can climb really quite effectively, so it can do full sort of grown-up steps. Um, so uh, um, 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 he's putting... Alan Ruddle, oh, is putting out hedgehog food in our gardens worthwhile. How long do we have? This is, you see, this is not simple. You see, you think that's an easy question. Um, yes, it is. It really, really is. But, um, yeah, okay, this time of year, definitely, because um, especially if it's a bit dry, uh, then it's very hard for the hedgehogs to get at uh, uh, the, the invertebrate food. Um, and also water, always, you know, water is also very important. My only concern, and this is hypothesis we have not explored, we do not have the answer. I am slightly bothered about extensive feeding at the end of the year, running up to hibernation. Uh, there are two triggers for hedgehogs entering hibernation, and they are uh, uh, the loss of food and the decline in temperature. And so I just have, yeah, I'm just a sneaking suspicion, wondering whether there is some sort of payoff that we need to understand better between encouraging hedgehogs to stay out of hibernation by giving them food versus them going into hibernation early. I simply don't know the answer. Um, on the whole, certainly right now, whilst they're coming out of hibernation when they're at the most vulnerable, definitely worth putting out food, they are carnivores, they eat meat. Whilst they will consume dairy products, as I've said, they're lactose intolerant, it's just they are not aware of the fact that they are lactose intolerant. Uh, so yes, meaty pet food, um, the most favored by the people on my Facebook group uh, is Tesco's Kitten Kibble. Uh, um, it's less smelly, um, and if you put it into a feeding station, so a, an upturned box with a hole in the side, 13 centimeters, uh, with a barrier in it as well so that the hedgehogs can go in and come round to the food then it tends to discourage rats eating it you put a brick on top stops dogs knocking it over you, the cats can't get at it because you've got the barrier there you can get it pretty much down as hedgehog food um and thank you to all the thanks for everything uh, from coming people could you remind us what to do if you find a poorly hedgehog before taking it to a rescue ah susie yes sorry your internet went down and um, basically uh, uh, the the key thing is the key thing not to do I think psychologically it's wrong to do it this way around. Maybe I'll sue the not to do. Don't do this, which is don't do, um, oh, there's a hedgehog in the garden looking really poorly in the middle of the day uh, with flies buzzing around it with some ticks on it and it looks a bit hungover or drunk or something. I'll go and phone the rescue. Because what they'll do is say, where's the hedgehog now? You'll rush outside and find it's gone. So pick the hedgehog up, stick it into a box, um, put a lid on the box, then make the call. If you've got a bit of time, then, then warm the hedgehog up first with, with a hot water bottle, two litre drinks bottle of water with warm water, give it a towel to roll up in, uh, food and water in uh, jam jar lids, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so, so then get in touch with the rescue centre or know where your rescue centre is already the closest to you. Um, and it's just, if you don't put a lid on it, they will escape. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, Yes, love is important. And um, we have a pair of hedgehogs in the garden. Now they need to be male and female from Lucy. Okay, um, one is the, the size difference between hedgehogs, you can't guarantee to identify male and female by size. Uh, you get big females, you get smaller males. Uh, there is one sure fire way of telling um, if the hedgehog is male and that's if it's got a penis. It, it, it's as simple as that. Uh, you turn the hedgehog upside down, persuade it to unroll, and if it looks like it's got a tummy button, um, that's its willy. So um, are they likely to be, it is quite possible that they might be, but they wouldn't be a pair um, of hedgehogs in the sense they wouldn't pair up. They, it's courtship, um, which can go on for an hour or so, 
then a, a, a brief moment of interaction followed by the male going off, you know what, I'm gonna go and feed up the hibernation now, you do all the hard work. Uh, so there we go. Uh, the neighbor's cats eat my hedgehog food. Yes, so you need to get the hedgehog feeding station in place, Liz. Um, if you do that, you can s keep the cats out of the way. And again, on the, the Hedgehog Highways Facebook group, there are so many different ideas that people have come up with, We're creating little mazes, because there are some cats which are very, very cunning. Um, so that they will, and some actually, they seem to be fluid, largely. Uh, so that they can sort of wind their way around things. But uh, yes, there are, there are plenty of good ex examples there. Does courtship and fighting sound different? <laughs> is that hedgehogs or otherwise? I'm not sure. Um, the, it is a very similar noise. Uh, uh, they aren't a massively vocal uh, animal. They, they make, they, they snuffle a lot uh, because their principal sense is smell and they will, so they rely on that and they've got a wet nose. So lots of bubbling noises through that. Um, but when they're grumpy, it is a plosive sort of <laughs> noise. And actually, that noise in courtship is the noise of the female passing a message on to the male. Not quite sure what it's abbreviated from, but anyway, <laughs> off, basically. Um, so yes, it, it's roughly the same noise. Um, how many babies, uh, Faith asks, does a hedgehog have typically in a litter? And it's about five. Um, and they tend to be within the nest for about five weeks before another uh, disappearing um, out into the wilds following mum around, not the male. If you see a bunch of hedgehogs, including babies out there, uh, uh, it's not daddy. Is that them all? Any more questions? I'm very happy to keep on until uh, you collapse, uh, until you've been beaten in submission and you've all bought my books and signed my petition. That's what I can <laughs> remind you again to do that. You, I don't know whether I missed it, but I saw in the chat from Susie, congratulations on getting the planning mm. thing changed. And I, I'm sure we would all want to sign up and agree congratulations well done well thank you but it still i mean I'm, I'm i'm thrilled with what we've got with the changing in the national planning policy framework but it is still just guidance there are no teeth and that's why i'm still continuing with the work because i need to get this changed so that it's got proper teeth so it is something you have to do what we have done i didn't even mention this god this is big news we've managed to get some of the major developers signing up to doing it now for pretty much every development they do. Uh, Bovis Homes did it at the beginning of 2020 and Taylor Wimpy, I think, I'm not breaching any confidentiality things, have come out saying that where they can, they now will. And what I have found is with this, you know, with this enormous reach of people, um, is that individuals are now noticing developments happening near them. And they're simply getting in touch with the developers and saying, look, there's nearly a million people signing this petition. This is actually stuff which people care about. And um, how about you just do it? How about not waiting for the law to change? How about you just do it? And uh, the success has been remarkable. There was one guy um, in Suffolk and he had three different developers moving in around his village. And the first developer was Linden Homes and uh, they'd just been bought out by Bovis and uh, their response was, oh no, no, we're already doing it. Yes. Okay, that was good. The second was a small family developer and they had no idea what he was talking about. Um, and so he explained it to them and they said, well, that's simple enough. And they're doing it. And the third were a big company, Persimmon. And they said, hey, you've got to be joking. We've already bought the fencing. We're not doing that. Um, and so all we did was have the conversation. He said, yeah, what do I do now? So I said, just keep going. Polite, persistent conversation write them letters about this, send them the links to the petition site, give them the information, you know, I've got all this information I can hand on to you. And it took quite a while, but in the end, Persimmon said, you know what, we're gonna do that, we'll do it too. And they're one of the worst, apparently, in terms of acceding to these sorts of things. So yes, I would love to get the law changed so they had to do it. If we can't get that, then I'd like to get it set in stone within each of the organizations that they do it themselves. And if we can't get that, then let's have everybody who sees a development near where they are. All you do is you go into the show home and just say, how about it? What? It costs 50p more a house. Um, and, and, and it probably it's cost neutral now. Um, and then you start the conversations about the public open space, the shared space between the new houses and development. You start to get them planted with wildlife sensitive planting. You begin the conversation with hedgehogs because they will have that conversation. Then you can open it up. 
what sort of planting are you going to put in place in the garden? So you're just going to have a blank canvas or are you going to maybe put in a shrub, a bush, a something local, something which is uh, a native, something which will attract insects, something, all of these things. What are you going to have in the open space behind it? And um, it's amazing how much ground you can get from these things if you just persistence. By the way, I saw the map you showed, the, the nocturnal GPS movements or yep. whatever it kind of was, was amazing uh, mm. to you. And uh, the, the concept of the golfing hedgehogs is just, uh, uh, probably won't leave me, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, are, are you by any chance sidling up to the Beaver Preservation Society as well? or? Ha, I've got a, um, I'm working with the Beaver Trust at the moment because uh, the book I'm doing, they are writing a, um, they're sort of doing a, a thousand word um, um, sort of end piece about their work. Um, it, it's a small book. I forgot any of the hedgehog one there. Here we go. So I wrote, Graph Egg were very pleased with the um, hedgehog book. And it's, it's, a, it's a small thing. It's only got 10,000 words. Lots of lovely pictures of hedgehogs. Anyway, so I'm doing the same thing um, for, for beavers and then I'm doing otters and then we'll see what else comes. It's, I actually have other books I really want to write, but they're not commissioned. Whereas, so people come along and offer you something which actually has money attached to it. It's, um, you kind of got to take it because, um, because yes, earning money, Money. Anyway, earning money is yet another thing that a freelance hedgehog ecologist finds difficult. Uh, but um, no, the, the beavers, beavers should be fun. I've had a lot of fun writing it, a lot of fun thinking the editor's not going to let me say that. Um, and then I've decided just to leave it in because there are beaver jokes galore. <laughs> uh, here we go. It's got more questions. Sorry. Um, uh, how many litters might a female have in a year? Uh, H, that is interesting, and we don't really know. It's thought that it's probably one, um, because the very late litters, which happen, which mean you get what are known as autumn orphans, which are too small to survive hibernation, are thought to come from first year breeding efforts. Um, so it seems that it's in their second year of life that hedgehogs breed most successfully. Uh, but it, it's possible that they will have more than one litter. We don't really know. Are you talking of con to the highways agency? Uh, so Faith, yeah, the, the, the concrete barriers in the roads, are, uh, it's difficult because um, we sort of don't want to encourage hedgehogs to try and cross the roads. We would rather have wildlife eco ducts built in over them like they have in the Netherlands and in France and in Germany. And, um, anywhere else with a vaguely ecological conscience. Um, so uh, it, it, yeah, putting holes in them also, it, it would be an enormous job. Um, how long do hedgehogs live? Good question. Well, I say most hedgehogs don't actually uh, uh, make it to their first birthday. Um, and uh, the, the hibernation is, is, is really tough um, uh, thing to go through. Um, but a really old hedgehog is seven or eight. We thought until this Danish researcher collected loads and loads and loads of carcasses in Denmark, same hedgehog in Denmark, uh, of Sophie Lund Rasmussen. She's just moved to Oxford, an amazing researcher. She found there are road sweepers who go around all over Denmark. And she just said, could you stick hedgehogs in a bag on the back of your um, road sweeping machine and uh, pop them in a the freezer and, 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 and let me know about them? And so she's collected thousands of dead hedgehogs, um, and, uh, but has been then doing analysis of their age and found some hedgehogs are living to be 11 or 12, she thinks. So we're not quite sure of the methodology there. Faith, uh, any other things we should uh, be putting um, forward? Or is it time to let uh, Hugh have his life back again? Yeah, just to say, yeah. I think that was one of the most entertaining talks we've had at Cafe Sai. It was re really good. So thank you very much. So please spread the words to people who pay. Yes. OK. Uh, because I, I love talking to a Cafe Sai audience because they're great fun. Um, however, I, I, I don't actually you have don't a job. Um, <laughs> so, um, it, so if you do have any groups that you work with who have got money, um, if any of you work for a business which would love to have an entertaining, a vivacious lunchtime lecture uh, around hedgehogs or, or beavers or anything else smutty, uh, I, I, can, I can definitely prevail. Um, I've, I've even, as Susie will uh, attend, I've even done readings of lessons in chapel, um, but, uh, but only when it mentions hedgehogs. 
uh, I, I had a stipulation for that. Okay. Um, so, but yeah, basically, um, yeah. give me give me cake and money, and I'll I'll, I'll turn up. Um, and yeah, just to remind people, it, it this is being recorded, so if other people missed the talk, I think there were quite oh, a few people. Who <laughs> what have I said? Oh, yes, of course they weren't paying. <laughs> Um, yeah, but it'll just, it, yeah, I'm go sure viral. it'll be viral. It's a miss. Uh, it's a thank you message, and and absolutely, I think it is thank you time, uh, Faith. Um, yeah. Uh, when ne the big boss uh, says it's time, it's time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 Complete faith. change next month, by the way. We've got quantum computing, and uh, <laughs> I've already understood the first word. So, <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, that might be. Is there a of speaker from stuff. from the new National Quantum Computing Centre that's being built on Harwell campus down the road? So, uh, be interesting to to hear what uh, they're doing. Um, but uh, for tonight, you. Uh, really was special. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, we, we, we really are particularly grateful uh, to you uh, for doing this talk uh, for our group. Um, thank you to Susie uh, for enabling it to come about. Um, uh, thank you to Penny for uh, doing the gymnastics on the recording. Thank you again for that. Um, <laughs> and uh, Faith, um, you are uh, just such a stalwart. Thank you so much um, for all the, the time and effort you put into making this group uh, come about. So uh, with those <laughs> thanks, thank you also to the audience. Thank you so much for coming. Thank and you. I hope uh, you will be able to come along and join us. Um, and hear what they're doing in quantum down the, the street. Um, but for now, uh, big, big thank you, Hugh, and go buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Hugh. See you soon. Bye-bye.